Word says, Your Word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. You establish the earth, and it endures. Your laws endure to this day, for all things serve you. Amen. May the Lord add blessings to the reading of his holy word. This morning we're here to worship him, the one true God. So we must humble ourselves because we are sinners and we have rebelled and we have fell, fallen short of our Lord. Would you pray a repentant prayer with me and would you pray for each other and pray for this service? I ask that you pray with me, that you lift your heart and your voices together with me. Let us go in the name of Jesus in prayer. Mighty God in heaven, Father, we humble ourselves before you. We know, Lord, that you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. We know that you are the one and only God. Yes, Lord, you are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But you are one, and you are one God. Help us, Lord, to be one with you. Fill us with your spirit, Lord. Have mercy on us, Lord, because we know we are sinners. Unworthy, Lord, before you. But, Lord Jesus, we believe that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the Holy One of God. And we believe that you died on the cross for our sins. You redeemed us, Lord. And, Lord, you were raised in the power of the Holy Spirit. And your spirit is with us. Help us, Lord, to worship you in spirit. Please, Lord, help us to come in your presence. Help us, Lord, because we are weak. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Father, I lift up to you, Lord, every soul that participates in this service. Whether, Lord, they are listening online or they're physically here today, I pray for them and I lift them up to you, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would help them, that you would empower them, that you would have mercy on them, and that, Lord, that you would let them come into your presence that what we do and say today, may it be pleasing to you and glorify you. We know we are weak. We know we're sinners. But Lord, we humble ourselves before you in your name for your glory to worship you, Lord. And we pray that your spirit would lead us and guide us. For without you, Lord, we are so weak, so unworthy. But you give us your righteousness and your goodness. So, Lord, help us to put away the world and ourselves and give this time to you. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Harps and thousand harps and voices. Praise above, I sing the praise and heaven rejoices. The Jesus praise the God of love. I sing He sits on yonder throne. The Jesus rules the world of all. Hallelujah, 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 Amen. I sing the glory. Pray forever, a thine on earth, a lasting crown. A nothing from thy love shall sever, for those who doubt and say thy own. At the object of thy grace, a death and he behold the face. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. A Savior hates and a fine appearing To bring all free the glorious name Of when the awful above us hear it Heaven and earth shall pass away And then with golden hearts will see And glory, glory to our King Hallelujah, hallelujah Hallelujah, amen, amen, amen. Now, happiness is to know the Savior. Happiness. 
Leben ist, genau das Ege Leben allein. Within his favor, having a change, in my behavior, happiness is the Lord. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me, in close relation, having a part in his salvation, happiness is the Lord. Will joy his mind, and no matter if teardrops fall, I found the secret. It's Jesus in my heart. Happiness to be forgiven, living a life that's worth the living, taking a trip. That leads to heaven, happiness is the Lord. Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is the Lord. Amen. Now.
worship and glorify our God, I ask that you please repeat after me. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Jesus is Lord. The Lord is good. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Please be seated. And as you're taking your seats, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Zechariah chapter 4. We're going to read 11 through 14 this morning. That's Zechariah chapter 4, verses 11 through 14. And Sister Dean's going to read for us in the Korean language. Sister Dean, please. 오늘 하나님의 말씀은 스가리아 4장 11절에서 14절입니다. 내가 그에게 물어 이르되 등잔대 좌우에 두 감람나무는 무슨 뜻입니까 하고 다시 그에게 물어 이르되 금 기름을 흘리는 두 금관 옆에 있는 이이 감람나무 두 가지는 무슨 뜻입니까 하니 그가 내게 대답하여 이르되 내가 이것이 무엇인지 알지 못하느냐 하는지라 내가 대답하되 내 주여 알지 못하나이다 하니 이르되 이는 기름 분 기름 부음 받은 자 둘이니 온 세상의 조합해서 있는 자인 자니라 하느라. 아멘. 아멘. Zechariah chapter 4 verses 11 through 14. Then I asked the angel, What are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Again I asked him, What are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? He replied, Do you not know what these are? No, Lord, I said. So he said, These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Amen. The Lord had blessed us to the reading of his holy word. Let us pray, please. Our Father, we again humble ourselves before you because you are God Almighty, and we thank you, Lord, for this, your holy word. And I thank you for this message and these people who, Lord, receive and hear your word and your message. Lord, would it touch their hearts, accomplish your goodwill. Lord, I pray that we all have eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us this day and every day that we may draw near to you. Again, we thank you for being the loving God and provider that you are. For it's in your name, Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Praise the Lord. Two olive trees, that's what we're talking about today. You know, God, in the previous uh, uh, verses, he had, he had actually revealed enough information to, to Zechariah to really encourage him. And, and this should enable Zechariah to encourage others uh, in the work of building the temple because, you know, that was God's uh, intentions. That's what God wanted uh, for the vision for those who received it at that time there in Israel at that time. That's what God wanted them to do. But despite a very clear explanation of the purpose of the vision, which had already been given to Zechariah, he wanted more details. Now, Zechariah especially wants more concerning these two olive trees, which would give him, not only him, but us, you and me, gives us more a complete understanding of the fifth vision that he's had here. Those who know much of the things of God are the ones who desire to know much about God. Uh, I have found that so true over the years uh, because some people don't want to know much about God, and they don't. But some people think they do, but they haven't really have a real desire or they have it for the wrong reasons. If you have a desire to know more about God so that you can draw near to Him, I guarantee you He will give it to you if you ask. So that's what we need to do is have a desire. Zechariah understood that God was the light of the world. And God was kindling this light through his golden lampstand, which today the golden lampstand is what? It's the church. 
It's the church, and we today are the true Israel. I know there's a nation called Israel, and I know there are people who are descendants of Abraham out there. And I know they think they are the true Israel. But today, through our faith in Jesus, the church is the true Israel. Zechariah here, though he kept asking until God reveals that his Holy Spirit will be poured forth through God's two anointed ones, so that God's light shines forth brightly in his church to the world. Now, I'm going to give you a little bit better explanation in this, just this. First, let's start out with persistence. The persistence here of the prophet of Zechariah. Even though the message from God was encouraging, Zechariah, he still had not totally understood the function uh, or what the trees were. What did they what, was, what did they symbolize? What were they doing? So in verse 11, De- uh, Zechariah, he renews his earlier question, again concerning the feature of the amazing two olive trees, which were supplying this unpressed oil for the continuous light of the lampstand. Now, he says, Then I asked the, gosh, the angel, What are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? Now, the vision of the lampstand remains with the prophet. It remains in his mind. He's looking at it. He he still don't understand it. And even after the answer given to him in verses 6 through 10, he's still confused uh, about this image. You see, it, it is the two olive trees which stand beside or sort of over each side of the lampstand in order to supply it with super continuous abundant oil and it still baffles Zechariah. He doesn't quite understand. You see, Zechariah had no experience with these olive trees. Because, you know, from the tabernacle or the temple, there were no olive trees there. He knew about the lampstand. He knew what that was, but there's never been any olive trees there. And so he didn't have any reference to help him understand what these trees symbolized. Nothing in the past. And these trees, they were so dominant in the vision that that Zechariah wanted more information than he had received from his question earlier in verse 4. Notice something. Notice that these two, uh, or notice that those, not these two, but those people who want to know more about the things of God must ask for those things. If you want to know more about God and his will, you must ask him to get more information. Jesus said himself in in chapter 7, 7, he says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. We must ask for the right reason, though, to know more. We must ask for the right reason. Do we have a burning desire in our hearts to know more about God? Or are we just trying to find out some information? Why why do you ask? Why do you want to know? Ask with a desire to draw nearer to God. If you do, God will hear you. Ask to understand uh, the two olive trees here. We must First, understand the golden lampstand. I want to make sure we understand the, that lampstand because the golden lampstand symbolizes Israel back when it is in the full fellowship and the blessings of God. When they were in fellowship with God, they were being blessed by God. And that's what Israel was meant to be in faith and expectation in the Old Testament times. That's why God called Israel to have fellowship with them and for them to be his missionaries, his priests to all the world. Remember the promise to Abraham was that he would be a blessing to all nations. That was what they were supposed to be. But the nation as a people, the nation, however, had failed in her calling from God. They had failed many times. If you're a student of the Old Testament and read the Old Testament, then you would know uh, 
how hard it was for them to stay with God and to follow him. The revelation of God and his glory had been given to Israel for her own enlightenment and so that she might be a light bearer to the rest of the world, to the rest of the nations. God had blessed them, but the nation continually rebelled against God. They persecuted and actually killed the prophets that he would send to them. They would not listen to the words of God. They disobeyed God. They disobeyed the word of God, which was given to them. They were blessed because they received the law. They received the commandments. They received everything from God, and yet they rebelled. They fell into disgraceful idolatry, the same idols of the nations around them, they were supposed to be light to them. They were supposed to teach them. They were supposed to show them the one and only God. But they failed because they started worshiping the same false gods that the nations were worshiping around them. They even crucified our Lord and Savior, the Redeemer, when he came to earth, when he fulfilled the Masonic promises, the promises of the Messiah. You see, basically, this last act of denying God and his Messiah and crucifying the Lord showed the nation's failure as a light bearer to the nations, and it actually resulted in the removal of their lampstand. They're no longer a lampstand. They're no longer shedding light to the world. They have not been ever since Jesus died on the cross and was risen. They have not been shining. They hadn't been really before because of their rebellion, but especially now, they're no longer the lampstand of God. When Jesus came in the flesh, he fulfilled all the prophecies regarding him before the end of time as we know it. He fulfilled everything in the Old Testament, all the prophecies. And when he died, the whole temple sacrificial system was fulfilled. Everything, it was fulfilled. It was no longer needed any sacrifices. Nothing was needed. Since then, the temple sacrifice system has been just a meaningless ritual. It means nothing. With Israel's lampstand removed, the light-bearing testimony passed over to people who were willing to receive it to the new Israel, and the new Israel is the church. We are the church. We are the Israel. We are the lampstand. You must understand that. With Israel's lampstand removed, the light-bearing testimony passed over to the people who were receiving it. Jesus said this. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, he says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people put a light in a lamp and put it uh, under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify who? Your Father in heaven. You see, today we are the light to the world. In Ephesians 5, 8 through 9 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. You see, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> because of Israel's blindness and rejection, now the church has the light and we have the responsibility of fulfilling the mission of serving the Lord and of letting his light stream out into the darkness of the world. I want you to think about that for a second. Now Israel doesn't have that responsibility anymore. We do. 
we are now to be the light, to show the light of God to the world. The world reels in darkness. It's up to us. But you know what? Unfortunately, yes, the church has faltered also, and, and we're really failing to reach the world with the saving message of the love of God, which is manifested in Jesus Christ. We fail so miserably. We're humans, after all, and all humans are sinners. The church is not the building. The church is not the pastor. The church is you, all of us. And God have mercy on us. In spite of all we have and all the years that we've been given to complete the task of evangelism, we have been insufficient in this, this necessary task. It's, it's not just necessary, it's absolutely necessary to go into all the world preaching and teaching about Jesus. In verse 12, the prophet continues to ask for details that will help him understand the two olive branches. He says again, I asked him, what are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out golden oil? Now, Zechariah obviously asked again, and I tell you, that's because he was persistent, and sometimes, not sometimes, most of the time, all the time, we need to be persistent to get the answers from God. We need to be persistent in prayer. Don't ask one time, for something, and you come to the pastor and say, well, I prayed about it, pastor. I said, well, when did you? Oh, about a month or two ago, I prayed about it, and I never got an answer. I like to laugh, you know, and I try not to hurt people's feelings. But God wants us to be persistent in our prayers. You know, don't ask one time. Just keep on asking. Keep on. You can't bug God too much. You know, I've had children, and when I used to teach young people, say, well, you know, I don't want to bug him too much. I said, see, you're thinking of God like your father and mother. <laughs> because these human brothers, they don't necessarily like to be bugged all the time. In fact, I can remember if I asked my dad too many times for something, I might get in trouble, right? Maybe some of y'all have had the same situation. But that's not the case with God. Keep asking. He's not going to punish you for asking. You know, the answer might be no, but keep asking, you know. Keep asking. Be persistent. This time, Zechariah here, he concentrates his question. Uh, he concentrates it upon the part of the vision that sort of really puzzled him. And maybe he sees something that he didn't see at first. So to know the full meaning, the prophet asked a more precise question, which I think is another learning point for us. You see, he focuses on the olive tree and the fruitful branches which were pouring this golden oil from themselves into the channels which carried that golden oil to the bowl that was positioned over the lampstand. Now, sometimes I think our questions are not specific enough. In fact, I think sometimes we ask for things and we're not specific enough when we ask for things. Be careful what you ask for. Think about this for a second. Because he may give you what you ask for when really that's not exactly what you wanted. You know what I'm trying to say here? Be specific in your prayers. I was talking to a young man. I say young man. He was in his 40s. To me, that's young. And we were talking about prayer, and I was telling, he was saying, I just want God to bless me. And I said, well, okay, God. God's blessing you every day. He said, but he's not blessing me with what I want. I said, well, well, if you just say, bless me, God's blessing you. He's answered your prayer. What is it you really need or want? Be specific. And then he had the gall to tell me, well, I don't have time. And I thought to myself, Lord, in mercy, have mercy on this man, this young man. He don't have time to be specific in his prayers. Well, there's the problem, wouldn't y'all say, at that point? 
all of a sudden his problem showed through. We need to take time to pray properly and be specific with the Lord. And that's what he's doing here, you know. Usually it's because we've not focused our thoughts or paid enough attention to the object of concern. Therefore, we actually hinder God from specifically answering our prayers if we don't specifically ask what we want or need. And the two olive trees here stand on either side of this lampstand, and under their extremely fruitful uh, branches are funnel types or channels, and, and these funnels catch the golden oil from these branches that produce, and they carry the fluid to the bowl right above the lampstand. This is a wonderful picture. The thought is that there is an infinite, now bear with me, an infinite and eternal supply of oil is provided for the lamps to the lampstand by these two olive trees. Infinite, continuous, never failing. Now I think there's no better illustration for the unlimited outpouring of the Holy Spirit can be found anywhere in God's Word except for right here. It symbolizes it so well. Who are these olive trees, though? There's two olive trees. Who are they? You know, for the people who initially received this vision, they may have thought them to be prophets, maybe, or, or maybe Zechariah himself and Haggai, or perhaps the priest Joshua and the ruler Zerubbabel. God used them mightily in their day. God did use them. But the true fulfillment of this prophecy of an overwhelming outpouring of the Holy Spirit did not come. It didn't happen at that time. It wasn't there. The Holy Spirit had not yet been poured out on all of mankind. God said this in Joel. It's rather long, but follow along with me if you have your Bibles. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. That's Joel chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. I will read it, follow along. I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance as the Lord has said even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. So God gave Zechariah an answer. He answered it. Again in verse 13, the angel sort of expresses surprise that Zechariah had not been able to work out this and understand it. He replied, do you not know what these are? And of course Zechariah says, no, my Lord, I said. He says, no. You see, the to me, the interpreting angel here certainly suggests that Zechariah should understand what this portion of the vision represents. But there's nothing to be ashamed of in honest confession of ignorance. You know, I can remember when I was a kid in, in school, I didn't want to ask questions too much in front of the class. Why? Because I, then I might be looking like the one that's the only one in the class that don't know the answer. Has that ever happened to you? But when I asked the question, guess what? People told me, you know, I, I wanted to know the answer to that question too. But they were afraid to ask, right? Well, listen, confession that you don't know is probably the way you should do be toward the God Almighty because he knows whether you know or not anyway, right? 
It's simply being a confession that you don't know. It opens the door to knowledge. The prophet's reply of, No, my Lord, prepares a way for the final answer, the real answer to the meaning of this vision. If he had said, Oh, yeah, I forgot. I know what it is. Then we wouldn't know because it wouldn't be in, in God's Word. Zechariah might have thought that an olive tree or its branches stood for the nation of Israel. And yet, it was broken off because it was unfaithful. And the church was engrafted into the natural or native olive tree. Romans eleven seventeen, which we've been studying in our Wednesday night Bible study. Romans 11, chapter 17 says, If some of the branches have been broken off in you though a wild olive shoot have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap of the olive root. That's the church. The olive branches stood for peace. But something is unusual here because the olive trees have never been known to produce so much oil without the olives even being pressed. These, these olives weren't picked. They weren't Pressed. There was nothing done. To, so the angel father clarifies the symbolism of the two trees in verse 14. So he said, These are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Hmm. Now some of you are thinking, What? That has no meaning to me. Well, if you knew Revelations, it might have some meaning. And that's one reason I am preaching through Zechariah as slowly as I am, bit by bit by bit, because y'all may not realize it, those of you that don't know, but the book of Zechariah and the book of Revelation, so they go together so well. Actually, I consider Zechariah the revelation of the Old Testament. And a lot of people do. Because it talks the same thing, the same way. So these, uh, they are. Per so the angel he he clarifies it. So the the, the prophet's admittance of ign ignorance in verse thirteen gave an opportunity for the the angel to teach him. And if we would admit our ignorance in God, he would gladly teach us too. You cannot teach someone who who already knows the answer or thinks they know uh, or they don't want to know. It's hard to teach somebody who's not receptive, right? These, the word these, means the two trees which are inseparably connected by channels with their fruitful branches. The two who are anointed. That's a literal translation of that literally means the two sons of oil. Two sons of oil. Now that indicates two sons of God which, uh, which characterize by, are characterized by fresh, continuously flowing oil. Not only are they anointed with oil, they are also branches which dispense oil. So, so the angel directs us to, know, to how we can find answers to this vision by defining these two trees as the two sons of the Holy Spirit. Two sons of the Holy Spirit, two uniquely gifted men. Two uniquely gifted men. Now let us always remember this. God always anoints his instruments. If he's going to use you, he's going to anoint you. You are anointed if God, if you're his instrument. Let us give him the glory for what his instruments do. Remember now, God uses people. He uses instruments. 
and let us praise him and thank him that he does because these two anointed ones were endowed by God's Holy Spirit so that they might pour forth the Spirit's power into the church so that it might shine forth the gospel light. Now, I know I've said a lot, but I want you to know something. Specifically, these two witnesses of the tribulation, they are two witnesses of the tribulation period. In fact, turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 11. This should clear up something for you, I hope. If you've been a little confused about what's going on here, maybe this will help you. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. I'd like for you to follow along. I could read more there, but this will be enough so that you can see what's going on here. Revelation chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. I was given a reed like a measuring rod and was told, Go and measure the temple of God and the altar and count the worshippers there. But exclude the outer court, do not measure it, because it has been given to the Gentiles. They will trample on the holy city for 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses. And they will prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Amen. Hmm. That's what Zechariah, what, that's what the angel was talking about back here in Zechariah. The two witnesses, the two olive trees. Hmm. Think about that for a second. These are two men who by their wisdom, their courage, and their zeal, they continually pour out the Spirit's power into the lampstand of the church of Israel so that it might shine forth the salvation of God into a dark world. Two men used by God. These are not angels. These are two anointed men. The title here, the Lord of the earth, is used because this is who the Lord will prove himself to be. Remember, this is prior to the millennium, and this will be the prelude to his universal authority as the Messiah comes to conquer all the invading enemies during Armageddon. Those two are the anointed by God. I think it's amazing. We don't know who they are. They may be alive today. They may be right here on this earth. We don't know when it's going to happen, but we know it's going to happen because it's in God's Word. In conclusion, God uses His called servants in all ages to supply the church with the Holy Spirit. Power. I guarantee you he does. And this is so that his, sh his church might shine the gospel forth into this sin-darkened world. Remember, they are the, the lost, they are blinded. They're, they're blinded by the world. They're living in darkness. They're lost. If they don't know Jesus, then what hope do they have? None. But in the last days, God will raise up two that he will have never, we will never have seen the likes of before. And they will see the church go home in the rapture, hallelujah, and remain to call forth 144,000 Jewish evangelists. Now, whether that is Abraham descended evangelists or church evangelists, because remember, who is the Israel today? We are. The church is. And you see, they will give the final worldwide call to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ as the Messiah. 
And these two anointed ones represent God's guarantee to me and to you that the church will not fail in their divinely given destiny. Those who belong to Jesus and were in his hands, we've accepted him as our Lord and Savior. We belong to him. We are always in his hand, and no one can take us out. And that means we are chosen. We're his chosen people, and we will become a worldwide witness and a blessing to all who come to the light of Christ, that they may be anointed also with the Holy Spirit to shine forth through his vessel of the light. And you know today, the vessel of light, the lampstand, is us, the church. The question you've got to ask yourself this morning is, are you part of the church? Are you part of the church? Now, I don't mean do you attend church. There's lots of people who attend church, but they're not part of the church. Because you are not part of the church unless you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You know, it should be the other way around. It should be your Savior and your Lord because he'll never be your Lord if you're not saved. Think about that. You're not part of the church unless you've been saved, and Jesus is your Lord. Please, I beg you, and I know the Spirit is calling you, accept Jesus today. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, how old be thy name? We know, Lord, your kingdom is coming. We know, Lord Jesus, that you're coming back. And you're not coming back as the Lamb of God. No, you're coming back as the Lion of Judah. And you're coming back to claim us, Lord, who belong to you. And our prayer, our heart's desire, is that all people would come to you because we know, Lord, that is your desire. Oh, Lord, we especially pray and lift up to you all who do not know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Oh, Lord, I know they think they're good people, and I know they are in worldly standards, but, Lord, they need you, Jesus, because we are all sinners. We've all failed you. And only your blood, only your sacrifice can cleanse us. So, Lord, we lift up to you those that are lost, those that do not know you, those who have not received you and have not believed in you, Lord. We especially pray for them that this time, Lord, that they would make a decision before it's too late they would come to you. Thank you for being the God of love that you are and giving us a chance after chance. Continue, Lord, to give us all chances, Lord. Please continue. Continue to be patient with us and forgive us all. Forgive us all where we fall short. For it is in your name, Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Would everyone?